The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. This is Brian Ankeny with Auto Success Magazine. Today, uh, I have the privilege of, of having Dale Pollock as our guest today. We're going to talk about reinventing how you source auction vehicles. A um, couple of things I'd like to, to, to let you know. This, this webinar will be a little bit different than some of our other webinars. Because we're going to cover several topics, um, if you have questions, we, we will address the questions you know, at, each, at intervals in between the topics as opposed to holding them to the end. So if you have a question, please look on the bar that runs on the right side of your screen there is a, a place where it says questions. Right to the left of that is a plus mark or plus sign. You click that and you can type in a question and then I will read those questions to Dale and he'll answer them for you. Um, one, one more thing I wanted to say before we get started today is, is that if you, if you haven't already, please join Auto Success Webinars. Auto Success Webinars is a group on Facebook. You just type it in the search bars, Auto Success Webinars, it'll come up. It's a place where you can interact with our speakers and, and other attendees. As, as you, you know, you're going to learn a lot of things on these webinars, and as you try to implement them in your stores, you know, you're going to have different challenges and great ideas that you can share with others. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dale. Hi, Dale. How are you? Uh, good, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, we'll just get started right away with the first question. Um, how, how do many dealers view wholesale sourcing as problematic? Well, wholesale sourcing um, is a broad uh, phrase or term that covers a lot of different uh, aspects of acquiring vehicles. But generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that uh, most dealers will acknowledge uh, some common uh, issues when it comes to sourcing used vehicles in the wholesale market. Um, it's a time-consuming process. Um, very often when you find, or very often it's difficult to find the cars that you want to buy. When you do find them, very often they're too expensive or you're not sure what to pay for them. And, uh, and then perhaps, you know, there is another issue that maybe not everybody will acknowledge but I think is pretty common and that is that although you think you know what you want, it's not necessarily uh, what you need. So. There really are a whole lot of issues when it comes to sourcing used vehicles. All right. What what makes the process so time consuming, Dale? Well, as I said, um, first of all, you know, finding the car you want. You know, there's over 300,000 used cars maybe in the market in any given day, and um, they're often on different auction house uh, platforms, which means that um, you have to go to a number of different uh, places, either virtually or physically, to see all of the available vehicles. And then uh, once you go to those places, which it's pretty difficult to go to all of them, um, you have to investigate the vehicles in terms of knowing uh, what their condition is, what their histories are and sort of vet each car one by one. It's uh, just a, a very tedious, time-consuming process if done correctly. And I think because it's so hard and because it's so time-consuming, the reality is that many of us just simply shortcut the process. And when I say shortcut the process, I mean maybe not uh, investigate or search for all the cars that might be available like the one you want, or perhaps not uh, spend as much time as you should um, vetting each car uh, before you make a decision to acquire it. So a lot, a lot of shortcuts, I think, are take a place, and those shortcuts often result in less than optimal uh, retail outcomes. All right. Uh, actually, we have we have our first question. It's from John. Um, outside of traditional auctions, what are other viable sourcing avenues in the industry today? Well. I think everybody would acknowledge that the best place to source a used vehicle uh, is at your showroom. That's probably pretty obvious to most. Um, but there's definitely a fine art to the practice of sourcing used vehicles even at your front door. And this is a, another area of great opportunity where um, I believe that uh, many dealers do not um, uh, take care or enough care to understand best practice uh, discipline when it comes to getting cars on trade-in from uh, prospective shoppers. 
uh, but outside of the trade-in realm, um, there's a lot of activity going on in the market today, sourcing vehicles directly uh, from consumers. There are a number of very interesting and viable third-party um, um, sources that do that. I had a personal experience with one of my relatives recently where my nephew uh, wanted to dispose of a vehicle. He'd recently moved from New Jersey to Chicago, and he didn't need his vehicle anymore, so he posted his vehicle uh, for sale as a private party online on AutoTrader. And uh, within 24 hours, he got contacted by a number of companies that uh, wanted to buy the car from him, and these were not private parties, but as I said, companies that are sourcing used vehicles on behalf of dealers. So there's really a, a pretty extensive and well-developed network of third-party solution providers that are just constantly trolling private party listings online. Uh, but I know that many other dealers have found success going directly to consumers online with their own uh, sort of sourcing brand, you know, some sort of we buy any car type of value proposition to their local markets and uh, do that very successfully. There's also been a lot of, uh, I would say, attempted activity in getting dealers to trade cars, used vehicles among themselves. And although, in theory, on paper, maybe that makes a lot of sense, there's a lot of practical challenges to doing that. But I suppose it's probably fair to say there's some of that going on. And hopefully one day with a new solution approach, uh, somebody will finally get that done right. But there's a company out there called Driven that I think is uh, attempting to do that in kind of a novel way. So I would watch that avenue, uh, you know, dealer to dealer sourcing, either directly um, or through a third party intermediary as being uh, another one that has emerging potential. Okay. How, how are new technologies helping dealers reduce the time required to, to source the vehicles, Dale? This is something that I have spent a great deal of time on over the past two years, recognizing that the frustration and the time involved in sourcing used vehicles in the wholesale market is, is a universal problem. I mean, I think it's fair to say that if you're the very smallest, um, you know, independent dealer or you're the largest, you know, mega dealer group in the nation, um, everyone has to source cars, and I think for the most part, everybody shares the same frustrations. So recognizing that a couple of years ago, um, I set out to create a solution which we recently introduced to the market called Stockwave that, um, that essentially uh, takes much, if not all, of the effort out of sourcing used cars. So um, the tagline of the Stockwave product is just turn it on. And that might be a little bit of a exaggeration, but basically what the system allows you to do once you have properly set it up and configured it is to turn it on. And what you see immediately when you turn it on are the vehicles and only the vehicles that match what you and your market uh, need and want. Um, and they're only vehicles that meet or exceed your qualifications in terms of history or condition or odometer mileage or vehicle equipment specifications, only those vehicles, importantly, that you can buy for the right amount of money that will allow you to make a profit that's consistent with your expectations. So uh, with that Stockway product, it essentially takes off the table all of those common problems at which we just spoke about, about having to sort through a lot of cars to find the ones you want, spend a lot of time vetting those cars, and then avoid a lot of the frustration of uh, attempting to buy those cars, bidding on those cars when you can't get them because they're going for too much money. So, you know, I think technologies of that nature, uh, Stockwave, are ones that uh, uh, have and, and will continue to come along and become refined that will take a lot of the burden out of sourcing used vehicles in the wholesale market. All right. Um, Dale, auctions have been around in the industry forever. Why are these solutions just available now today? Um, you know, largely because of the lack of transparency in the um, wholesale marketplace. Um, you know, it wasn't all that many years ago that you had to physically show up at an auction to see what was available for sale and what they were going for. And then, of course, the 
internet came along and uh, transferred a lot of that information to the internet where you didn't necessarily have to show up. You could go online to learn what was available, see uh, market pricing uh, being created in a live environment, and actually transact on those vehicles virtually. Um, but even with that, one of the primary issues or obstacles for um, transacting or shopping online is the issue of the condition of the vehicle because you know there's nothing that really can uh, rival the experience of being there physically touching the vehicle you know um, uh, you know smelling the vehicle listening to the engine run um, and yet um, today there are technologies that uh, don't eliminate the risk of not being able to do that in the physical environment, but definitely uh, reduce or mitigate the risks. So the, the technology of, of reliably representing a vehicle online and, um, and you know, conveying assurance to buyers that, um, that they can recover if they buy a vehicle that they shouldn't have bought because they couldn't physically touch it. Um, you know, these sort of solutions have come along only in recent times, recent uh, uh, year or two, that make it really a viable thing to start uh, transacting more vehicles online, and not just transacting them, but actually vetting them. You know, the vetting process of vehicles online uh, can be very frustrating. So, you know, it, it really has to do with the ever-increasing transparency and reliability of data online to make decisions, um, which is in the past retarded the um, the transition from physical to virtual, but it's coming along now. All right. Um, what trends are you seeing in in-lane versus online auction purchases, Dale? To be sure, uh, ever more vehicles are being purchased online for the reasons I said. You know, greater reliability, greater transparency more information being able to be reliably conveyed online. So I think it's pretty fair to say that for most auctions, they're seeing a pretty consistent transition from in-lane buying to online buying. And of course, there are multiple versions of online buying. But um, I was at an auction not too long ago in Denver. And uh, most of the, and it had been a little while since I'd been there, but most of the activity, the bidding and buying activity was being done um, online, relatively few people in the lane, but nevertheless, what was happening was pretty robust. It was just uh, largely being done online. I also, uh, you know, and I've seen this before, and I'm sure many of our listeners have as well. You know, even when you're in the auction, you see a lot more buyers sitting at computer terminals or on their own device, um, buying cars or searching for cars online, even though they're at the physical location. So that trend is uh, ever present, and I think will only continue to grow. All right, let's go to the next question. What factors are leading to increased online wholesale sourcing, Dale? You know, there's a lot of factors. Uh, you know, the transparency and the reliability of the data that I mentioned, but I think it's also uh, the case that. Uh, good informed buyers are today more attuned to the fact that what they should be buying is not necessarily what just happens to catch their fancy, um, you know, at a particular moment, but they're becoming more data driven and buying more vehicles that are ones that their market is demanding and ones that their dealership. Uh, actually needs based on current supply and demand. So um, I think that you know the, the science coming into the industry rather than being driven largely by emotion and when I also talk about the science, I talk about the economic science, you know of being sure that on any given transaction you've paid a price that would allow you to properly uh, cover your uh, expenses of transportation, reconditioning, tax, if any, and, and profit objective, and yet still price the vehicle in the market at a reasonable uh, uh, place. 
So, you know, a lot more uh, intelligence is really being applied um, to the acquisition process rather than emotion and gut instinct. And I think that all that science that goes into it being um, applied by most effective buyers uh, creates the need for technologies and also uh, creates uh, the opportunity to do it at a lower cost uh, structure, uh, that being the online environment rather than the physical environment. So, you know, the science and the sophistication of the science is really drawing a lot of it to technology and to the Internet. Okay. Why do auction purchased vehicles prove problematic for many dealers, Dale? The dealer who wins the car at auction is the person who would consider the vehicle to be of highest value. I mean, it, the car goes to the last buyer with their hand in the air. So just by definition, uh, when you buy a car at the auction, you're paying top dollar. And I don't necessarily think that paying top dollar is a problem so long as you recognize that you have paid top dollar and then um, conduct yourself from that point forward appropriately. So what does appropriate mean? Well, appropriate means getting the car quickly reconditioned into the front line. And when we talk about the front line today, there are two distinct front lines. There's the physical front line and the virtual front line. And with respect to the virtual front line, um, I have come to know that the best practice among dealers uh, who buy cars at auction are to get them posted within minutes of the bell ringing on the car. And that's the car with photos, not necessarily the final or greatest photos, but the initial photo um, with the description that's pretty robust with an appropriate price within minutes. The physical front line is also very critical that we get those cars uh, to the front line properly. But to the question of why dealers often struggle with cars that are purchased at auction, it's because they often pay top dollar for the vehicle and they are not mindful of the need to get the vehicle merchandised quickly. And then, you know, if you do own a vehicle, however it's purchased, but commonly purchased from auctions at top dollar, you have to get in and out of that car quickly. There is absolutely no substitution for recognizing a vehicle that you own for a lot of money is being a car that has a defect. And that defect is one that you have to recognize and, and, and turn out quickly. You want to get your money in and out of a car quickly in general, but particularly when you own the car for a lot of money. So, you know, I think that that is really the trap for dealers that buy vehicles at auction. They pay, by definition, top dollar for the car and then they treat those cars as they might treat any and every other car with not enough urgency to turn it. But if you pay top dollar for a car, price it, and sell it quickly, um, you can you know, repeat that process over and over and make money doing it. All right. Uh, Dale, what do you see as key challenges or opportunities in the wholesale market in the months ahead? It happens to be the case that every single year I watch the same uh, phenomenon occur over and over, and it seems like as an industry we never really learn from it. So what I'm referring to is this, that for most dealers right now we are in the uh, strongest selling season of our entire year. For a lot of different reasons, uh, the springtime characteristically uh, is our strongest peak selling season. So right about the time that spring comes along, every year without fail, I get a lot of uh, telephone calls and notes and comments from dealers that say something like, oh my gosh, I finally got it figured out. We finally have it dialed in. We finally hit our stride. We've got it handled now. and and you know, largely the reason why everybody is feeling so good about themselves 
and, and their management prowess this time of the year is at least in some part due to the fact that it's springtime. You know, um, rising tide lifts all boats. And, and what we fail to recognize every single year at exactly that same moment is that the wholesale market has reached its peak. So think about it. Right about the time that we as dealers feel like we finally have this thing nailed, without recognizing it, the ground underneath our feet is beginning to shift downward. So what that causes is us invariably this time of year, due to overconfidence, to go out and buy more cars than we should, believing that these current sales volumes are going to continue forever, and they never do. But we go out, therefore, and buy cars that we think we're going to sell, and we're doing it at absolutely the wrong moment because it's the top of the market. And then invariably comes you know, August or September when sales plateau and then begin to decline that we find ourselves, oops, with too much inventory that we purchased you know, 60, 90 days ago at the very top of the market. And now the wholesale value of those vehicles is substantially lower. The retail value of those vehicles is substantially lower. And our sales are substantially lower. And, and in the fall, just like I got the messages in the spring about everybody having finally figured it out, in the fall, I get a similar quantity of messages saying, oh my God, I don't know what happened. It seemed like we were going along. How did we get in this rut? You know, How did we end up with this much staged inventory? And I see this pattern play out repeatedly every single year. And it just has to be understood by every used car operation today that you are at the top, or if not at the top, very close to the top of the wholesale market. It's only going to plateau and level off and go down from here. And your sales, no matter how good you might be, uh, will hardly ever rival springtime sales volume levels. So now is the time really, um, as you should always, be particularly concerned about your inventory level. So if I had to give a dealer advice about you know, what to do in the coming months, um, this is the advice I'd give them, is to pay very, very careful attention and be very disciplined about your uh, inventory levels. So then that sort of raises the question, how should I decide what is the right level of used vehicle inventory to be maintained? Well, let me begin by telling you what should never be the proper indicator of inventory levels. It should never be it's springtime so we should stock up. It should never be we want to add more cars because we want to sell more cars. It should never be that we want to buy a lot of cars because they're cheap right now. It should never be that we need more cars because our lot looks empty. None of those are ever proper justification in my opinion to adjust inventory size upwards. The only valid justification for increasing inventory size is to regulate turn. So let me explain what I mean there. At a minimum, and I stress at a minimum, in order to have profitability, you should never maintain a used vehicle inventory size that's greater than your average monthly retail sales. In other words, your used vehicle inventory should at all times be turning at a minimal rate of 12 times per year or one time per month on average. That should be a minimum. If you are not turning your inventory retail at least 12 times per year, one times per month on average, you've got too many cars. You have absolutely no business in the coming months purchasing more inventory. You need to sell what you have. Now, if you get your inventory turned to a level that many dealers do today, that in my opinion is somewhere around 15, 16 times per year or greater, then unless you are either capital or space constrained, now you have a justification to do one of two things. Either slightly raise your price, which will slow your turn, but bring more profit to the bottom line, 
or alternatively increase your inventory size. But never add more vehicles to your inventory to bring your turn down below at least 12 times per year or one times on average per month. So regulating inventory turn between 12 and I would say on the high side 15 or 16 is the way to assure yourself that you have the proper level of inventory. Now, one word of caution or note about this advice, it is absolutely the case, possibly, that if you had had more vehicles, you would have sold more vehicles. And my advice to you is get over it. Get over it. Because on the chance that if you did have more vehicles and you didn't sell more vehicles, what you're going to end up with are aged inventory. And there's absolutely no future in holding aged cars. So my firm advice when thinking about um, you know, purchasing in the coming months is to maintain retail inventory levels that are consistent with a minimum of 12 and a maximum, let's say, of 16 retail turns per year. Okay, Dale. Um, we talked about technology available today. Uh, what will auction solutions look like in the next three to five years? What's coming, what's coming down the road? That's a really interesting question and one that I am spending a lot of time thinking and working on. Because I have a particular philosophy that auctions represent a marketplace. And if you think about marketplaces, in the ancient days, people, buyers and sellers, would come to a designated location at a designated period of time to learn and acquire information about what people have to sell or what people want to buy. They would exchange information that would allow pricing to be determined that would affect transactions. And in the, in, the, in the years you know, gone by, we had to come together physically in order to affect that sort of transaction. And then the internet came along and allowed us to create the equivalent of a physical marketplace in a virtual environment. But still, buyers had to post what they had to sell with all the relevant information Buyers had to show up virtually and peruse and communicate and, and exchange information with sellers very often in order to affect a transaction. But, but basically what happened is that the physical environment transferred to the virtual environment, but they were still marketplaces. And I think that the next evolution of a marketplace is a network. And I think that we can see plenty of examples outside the automotive industry where marketplaces haven't been done away with by networks, but they've been augmented by networks. So let me give you a couple of examples. In the employment arena, it used to be if you wanted a job, you might go to a trade conference and talk to prospective employers, or you might go to a job fair. And people still do that. But there's this new thing now called LinkedIn. And that is a network that has overlaid the physical marketplaces. And, and that network works today because there is transparency and availability of information about both buyers and sellers about what they have to offer each other. That means that they don't have to go up, at, they don't have to both show up at any given place to learn about what each other has to offer, there can actually be a connection made in an automatic manner. And another example of that is dating. You know, it used to be that in order to find a date or a mate, you used to have to go perhaps to a club or to a bar, which is a form of a physical marketplace, to learn about what is available, what people want and what people don't want. And people still do that today to be sure, but now you have this thing called Match.com. And once again, the difference there is because we know so much about what somebody has to offer and what somebody else is looking for, that rather than having to have those people show up at a designated time or place, 
to learn about each other, the network can make automatically the connection. And I can go on and on with similar examples of how networks have not replaced marketplaces, but have augmented marketplaces and allowed connections and transactions to occur in a more cost-efficient manner. But if you take those experiences and apply them to the wholesale market, it's clear to me that we still have to show up as a buyer or a seller, either physically or virtually, at a designated place at a designated period of time to learn what each and, and what to learn what each other has either to offer or what they have to buy. And I think that the future of our wholesale auction business will never be to replace that, but to be augmented because today with technology and the availability of information about what sellers have to offer and all of the relevant details and what buyers uh, want and need to buy and all the relevant details about what they're willing to pay, we can automatically make those connections and, and create a network effect that overlays the physical and virtual marketplaces that we all call and call auctions. And when we do that, what we will be able to achieve is greater efficiency. We'll be able to transfer vehicles from sellers to buyers that are more appropriate, that are at a reasonable and agreed upon price, and with much less cost and effort involved on the part of both buyers and sellers. So to answer your question where I think we're headed and where I would like to really spend and, and I will be spending and deploying a lot of resources is to create that network environment to overlay the traditional auction marketplace. All right. I have a follow-up question to that. Um, you know, how, how, would, how would the bidding process work um, if, if, it, if it wasn't uh, like time controlled, if there wasn't like a set time, you know, like, like a start and a finish, if it was just, you know, bringing, bringing buyers and sellers together, how, how would the bidding process work? Have you, have, you, have you figured that out? Well, absolutely. You see, if I know, if I know enough information about buyers in a given market, on any given vehicle that a seller might have to sell, I can pre-identify every buyer who needs that vehicle. Not only can I identify which buyers need that vehicle, if I know and have enough information about those buyers in terms of how they price their cars, what sort of profit they desire to make, how much their average reconditioning is for a vehicle of that type, what their packs are. If I know all of that sort of information about all those buyers, what I can do is I can rank order them and present to the seller of that vehicle without any effort on the part of the buyer or the seller which buyer is willing to pay the most amount of money for that vehicle at any given moment in time. And therefore, we don't need to worry about the bidding process. I, we already potentially know who needs it and who's willing to pay the most amount of money. So if we can identify that, without bothering anybody to do anything, why wouldn't we just ship the car to them? And then if they didn't want the car, which would be irrational because by every objective indication, they need the car, their inventory needs it, their market demands it, and it's at a price that is, they're willing to pay based on their profit expectation, their, their, their transportation reconditioning costs, why can't I just ship the car to them and if they don't want it, I'll take it. And think wow. about how much more efficiency that experience will bring to the marketplace. That's where we're headed. Wow, that's that's fascinating, Dale. <laughs> that, that's that's really cool. Um, well, um, what kind of results have you heard from dealers using these technologies, Dale? Well, the technologies are, are new. In, in the case of Stockwave, for example, um, it's only really been in the market for about 60 days. But the early indication is that the dealers that are using it are validating the fact that it saves an awful lot of time and effort. But, you know, two things to be noted there. Number one, we're just beginning, absolutely just beginning. Stockwave as it exists today in the market is truly in its infancy stage in terms of what it will ultimately be able to do 
and what it will ultimately be able to deliver to both buyers and sellers in terms of efficiencies and better uh, inventory sourcing. And then the second thing to be noted is that sadly, and I guess maybe to be expected, it requires a change of behavior. You know, all of us are creatures of habit. We've all been sourcing vehicles the old-fashioned way, the traditional way. And even if something presents a better option or a better alternative, um, it's still different. And because it's different, there's a segment of people who will shy away from it, um, who will wait and see to see if it actually creates a superior result or advantage for others before they'll sign on. So these are, you know, these are expected characteristics and features of adoption curves. And as a creator, as an innovator, they never fail to frustrate me because I see the opportunity and yet um, the adoption curve is never as rapid as we'd like them to be. Although I will tell you that the success of this particular product, Stockwave, has far exceeded anyone's expectations. We have uh, probably today close to 1,200 dealers in roughly a 60-day period that have signed on. But ultimately, the real true test is their experience after they've signed on. And it's early, but early indication is that it's proving to be of great value. All right. This, this is a question from Tom. Um, and then, Dale, this question came in as I was reading you the last question. So I believe that this is in regards to the question before the last. Uh, isn't that what DealerTrack has with their group trading? Well, I can't speak specifically to what uh, DealerTrack has with group trading um, because I'm not 100% sure of what that means. I think it means different things. You know, group trading, in, in my opinion, is a good idea in theory, but I seldom see it work well in practice. You know, even if uh, a number of dealerships are under common ownership, and even if it makes sense that if one dealership wants to sell a vehicle and another dealership in that group needs or wants to buy that vehicle, there are all sorts of cultural issues that prevent the transfer of that vehicle being done. And I think that you know anybody in the used car business will relate to this because it's common that I always think that that other guy wants too much money for his car or he owns his car for too much money. Or I don't like the way he reconditions his vehicles. I recondition mine better than he does. Or, I mean, there, you can just go on and on with the issues. Sometimes the issues are just ego related. You know, I don't want to help that guy out or I don't want to sell him a car, you know, because he's my rival, even if we're under common ownership. So it makes sense in theory among dealers to trade cars among themselves, but for a lot of practical and cultural reasons, which are sometimes valid, sometimes not valid, but nevertheless present, uh, dealer to dealer trade networks um, have proven to be very challenged, and and seldom do you see them work. Um, and and when they do work, and 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 in my experience, they are in very limited cases. It's because there's somebody at the very top who says this is absolutely what is going to happen, whether you like it or not, and they and they make it happen by executive fiat. But in reality, there are very few high-level corporate managers that are prepared to be that firm. Because at the end of the day, they want their used car department managers or general managers to, to have accountability for the outcomes. And if they sort of force transactions, um, then it's very easy for the guy on site to say, you know, don't blame me for the outcome. You made me do that. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical or maybe cynical about the viability of dealer trade networks as we know them today. All right. Um, actually, we have a, a statement kind of question from Jonathan. Uh, Dale, Jonathan wrote, I agree with Dale on people buying in, but I also believe that a younger purchaser might be more open to try a newer sourcing avenue. Do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I, I think that's true. 
I think that's true, but um, <laughs> you know, sometimes you know, younger doesn't necessarily uh, correspond to the chronology of, 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 of years because you know, somebody who's really done it a long time the old way, whether they're young or old, you know, has a hard time. I mean, it, it, I think generally speaking, that that's a true statement. Younger buyers are more willing to to try something new because just by definition, they haven't been doing the old thing as long as older people have. But, but ever, ever, you know, surprised these days when I see an old, you know, timer, you know, the light bulb goes on and they make the transition. And I love those moments. And similarly, I'm frustrated by the 24-year-old person, you know, who's only been doing it a couple years, but been doing it the old traditional way that just can't get their head around doing it. But I think there is some truth to that statement. All right. Well, at, at this point, if anybody has any further questions, please please send them in. Um, Dale, I appreciate, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. I think this was a great webinar. Um, Dale, is there anything else that you would like to, to share with our, our listeners? Well, I'd just like to thank the listeners. I mean, you guys took time out of your day to spend, uh, share some of it with me, and I just want to say thank you. And if there's ever anything that I can do for any of your listeners or readers, um, I want you to know that I'm available to you. You don't need to buy anything from me. You don't need to pay me anything. I learn every day, and I learn from the people that are on the front line doing it. And my passion truly is to help you guys win and succeed. And if I make something along the way, that's nice, but that is not my primary motivation. So I'm absolutely privileged to communicate, to help in any way I can, anyone that I can. So thank you all for the opportunity to be together today. Great. Well, hey, everyone, if, just, in case, just in case you haven't joined yet, please go to Auto Success Webinars on Facebook and join the group. I will be posting this webinar there a little later. If there's anyone else in your organization that you would like to share this with, you can go there and, and, and share it with them. Um, if, if, if you have any topics that you would like to see covered or speakers that you would like for us to invite, please you know, feel free to email me or, or contact me through Facebook. This is Brian Ankney, and my, my email is brian, B-R-I-A-N, at autosuccessonline.com. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dale, and I hope to see you all soon on another webinar.